for people unfamiliar with you, uh, please tell us your name and what your background is and what you've been doing for the last several years. Sure. Um, I'm David Wallinga. I'm a physician with the Natural Resources Defense Council. I've been working at the intersection of the environment, food, agriculture, and health for 20 plus years, primarily as an advocate, uh, scientist, public health doctor. How did you get involved with the subject of antibiotic resistant bacteria? In the year 2000, uh, so almost 20 years ago, a bunch of nonprofit groups got together and we had a meeting where we talked about the problem of antibiotic resistance and antibiotics being overused in livestock in particular and how we thought that this was a huge issue that was virtually um, overlooked um, by, by both the public and by environmental groups at large. And so we created a coalition to address that. And uh, amazingly, that same group of groups is still working together today with some changes here and there, but it, it's really unusual that there has been a, a campaign running for that length of time on one issue. If people have been eating chicken for a long time, and many people are in their 80s and 90s, doesn't that mean that chicken is okay to eat? Uh, I, I, I personally am, am an omnivore, to use Michael Pollan's words. Um, I, I eat just about everything. What I'm much more interested in is how the food that I've eaten has been produced and what go, what's gone into it, because ultimately I think that's at least as important as sort of the nutritional category, whether it's a meat or a vegetable. Um, so my work, but also you know, sort of my inclination as a consumer is to think about those bigger environmental issues. What is different about a a chicken in 1919 versus the year 2019? Yeah, so 100 years ago, um, chickens were scroungers. You know, they were out in somebody's backyard picking seeds up off the ground, you know, finding worms or little insects. And uh, that meant their diet was very varied. It also meant that they got plenty of exercise um, and they lasted a lot longer than today's chickens. So chickens today have been through an enormous amount of breeding. Um, they've been bred primarily for one thing, which is putting on a lot of weight quickly. Um, they eat a very different diet. Um, it's fed to them. They don't go get it. And it's mostly f the kinds of things that we grow way too much of in this country, um, corn, um, grains, um, things that are designed to put calories on them quickly. So their diet's very different, and then they're also raised indoors in these enormous sheds where they're crowded together and not really exercising at all, um, getting much sunlight. So I think both those things probably have had an impact on the nutritional quality of the chicken in some way, but also things like whether or not they're carrying antibiotic resistant organisms. When were antibiotics invented and put into regular use and what was different about health and medicine and disease prevention before and after the introduction of antibiotics? Antibiotics were, I think most people kind of have a sense that's correct about them coming about just before World War II. Um, Fleming, I think, was making his initial discoveries in the mid-1920s. Um, it was an, sort of an accident in the laboratory, and then others were making similar sorts of discoveries that this mold that contaminated his Petri dish uh, was producing something that was preventing bacteria from growing, and uh, the name of the mold is how he came up with the name penicillin. Um, it took a while for, uh, it took a while and it took circumstances 
uh, to create the conditions where penicillin was broadly manufactured, namely World War II. So suddenly you've got millions of people at risk of infection and they knew they had to get production ramped up quite quickly uh, to meet the needs of the service. And, you know, it was basically a, a government war effort and, you know, with huge success, you know, arguably, I don't know that anybody knows the numbers, but it made a huge difference to have something in the field to treat wounded soldiers. Second part of your question, though, um, medicine, I have a little bit of perspective, um, but it's nothing you couldn't read in a book. But my, my great-grandfather was a physician, my grandfather was a physician, um, both of them practiced, you know, in the pre-antibiotic days. Physicians had a very different role then, especially somebody who was a generalist like me. They, they wouldn't have been doing surgery, uh, or, or they might have been doing very general surgeries, but simple surgeries. Um, and a lot of infectious diseases, their role was to, you know, um, diagnose and kind of help the patient out with symptoms, but it was almost up to fate and in their general health to, as to whether they were going to survive that infection. You know, even common infections like pneumonia were killing huge numbers of people. Uh, children were dying with regularity from common infectious diseases. So, the the somebody like me who's you know mid 50s who's grown up with antibiotics the world couldn't be more different than the world of somebody like my grandfather who grew up without them are there antibiotics in fish farms there's been antibiotics in virtually all kinds of farming just to give you an idea of the scope um, there's enormous amounts of antibiotics used in livestock um, cattle production, dairy production, uh, pig farming, chicken farming, turkey farming. There's antibiotics used in fish farming, although probably at much lower levels than those other things. Uh, although the little shrimp that are factory farmed in Asia that you get in your curries or your Thai food probably have tons of antibiotics used. Um, there may be antibiotics used in salmon pens, you know, for farmed salmon. And then things that nobody ever thinks about except for me, like ethanol. We grow corn and then we put it in a fermentation vat and throw in some antibiotics and out comes ethanol that you stick in your gas tank. Uh, and we're subsidizing the production of that and the use of the antibiotics is pretty unregulated, so um, nobody really knows about it or is tracking it. How do you know about it? Well, because I've been doing this for 20 years and you run across stuff and go, gee, nobody knows about that. I better learn something about it. And then you submit a Freedom of Information Act request and ask the USDA, you know, how much antibiotic it, are they using? Uh, what are the levels of resistance? In the, uh, in, in the ethanol, or the, the reason this all comes full circle is that when you make ethanol, there's a lot of leftover stuff. You siphon off the liquid, the ethanol, and what you've got is called dried fermentation grains, and that ends up being something that is sold back to the livestock farms and is a big part of the feed that's given to cows, pigs, so actually, they're not only getting the antibiotics in their feed, but they're also getting feed from ethanol vats that has antibiotics already in it. Aren't antibiotics a good thing that has cured many people from infections? If you have an infection and you need an antibiotic, it's an absolutely good thing. Um, and we should be and we will continue to use them for that. The problem is that we're overusing antibiotics to a huge degree. Some of that overuse, a lot of it, is taking place in clinics and urgent care centers where people come in and they say, gee, I've got this cold and I really think I need an antibiotic. And this happened to me once early in my career, actually. 
the doctor says, well, I don't think you do need it because you have a cold and that's caused by a virus. And then the doctor, uh, then the patient pushes on the doctor and the doctor gives in and writes a prescription for them. What happened to me was the clinic doctor said, uh, this patient complained to me because they came and asked for an antibiotic and you wouldn't give it to them. And I said, that's right, they had a virus. He said, the patient's always right, next time give them the antibiotic. <laughs> and that still goes on today. So about half of the antibiotics prescribed in the clinic setting we think are unnecessary. And that's wrong and that's overuse. Um, on farms, on U.S. farms, the figure is probably much higher. Uh, judging by countries that have been able to reduce their total antibiotic use on farms by 65, 70 percent, I expect that uh, it will turn out after the fact that U.S. farms have used about 70 percent more antibiotics than they really needed to. What antibiotics are fed to animals and why? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there's really two categories of antibiotics that are fed to animals. Ones that are medically important, in other words, the same drugs we use in people. So that includes things like penicillins, tetracyclines, erythromycin, sulfa drugs. I mean, there's actually seven or eight different classes. And then the others, which are non-medically important, um, are things we don't use in human medicine. So the most important of those is called ionophores. Well, the ones we use in human medicine, we care much more about because obviously if you're using those, you're more likely to trigger resistance to form to those drugs. And then if you try to use that same drug in the human population, there's a greater chance that you've eroded how uh, effective it will be. Um, so most of what I've been talking about here today have been uh, dealing with these human uh, hu drugs of human importance. And they make up the vast majority of the antibiotics used on the farm, actually. Um, why are they being used is a good question. Uh, and it's tough to, an tough to answer, harder than it should be. By that I mean that in an ideal world, we would know exactly how many antibiotics and which antibiotics are used in farms. But neither the FDA nor the USDA wants to go on farms to find out. Um, I think they're getting a lot of pressure not to do that. And farmers don't want them, and by extension us, to know what antibiotics are being used and in what amounts. Uh, otherwise, we might do something about it. Um, so, but in general, we know from Europe and other places that antibiotics are used to treat sick animals, but that's really, really the small minority they use. The rest is used either to control diseases, in, infections in flocks or herds where just some of the animals are sick. And in general, I don't really have a problem with that as long as it's a very occasional use. But I think the vast majority of the use now is antibiotics put in animal feed or in drinking water to, in the name of preventing disease, even though the animals are healthy. So there's no vets diagnosing a condition in these animals, they're healthy. And they're using the animals basically uh, because they think it's gonna keep the animals from getting sick, even though the conditions in which they're being raised are really uh, not very good and are likely to make the animals sick. So an alternative would be to improve the conditions that you're raising the animal in, give them more vaccines, give them more space to move around in, feed them better, use better breeding, but instead they've been using antibiotics because it's sort of a quick and dirty Band-Aid and because they can. What's the difference of a pig we eat today versus a pig from say 100 years ago? Yeah, um, well, some of the things are just like chicken. We're feeding, pigs used to get slop, right? They would get anything that the farm didn't use for another purpose. And you'd throw it out in the pig sty and, and that's what they would eat. Uh, probably supplemented by some other grains and things. But now we're raising pigs in these sheds indoors. They're 
feed is very uh, carefully mixed. It's almost all corn and soybeans or other feed grains because it's got a high energy content. And um, I think one of the big differences is that pigs used to be farmed all over the country. They were pretty dispersed. Now we've concentrated the pigs so that there's a lot of pigs on one farm. So the pig farms are much bigger than they used to be. Um, I think something like 80% of the pig farms have disappeared, but the 20% that are less are vastly more larger. But the other big difference geographically is that just a few places now create a ton of pigs. So the eastern half of North Carolina, ton of pigs. Iowa, number one pig producer. Pigs in Iowa outnumber people 10 to one. Minnesota, number three, huge number of pigs where I come from. And even then, it's not like every county has pigs. They're usually concentrated in just a few places. So the pollution in those counties is enormous. There's tons of manure pollution. The streams are polluted. The air has odors and resistant bacteria and dust. So the people, the communities living around those pig farms are really impacted, even if we're not looking very hard to, to find that. When we do look, we find that people are very impacted. Is there a difference in the cows we eat today versus the cows from, say, 100 years ago? Well, 100 years ago, we still probably had cows being raised on grasslands in the middle of the country, even being driven in cattle drives to slaughterhouses. They're, out, they're raised out in the range. It was still a pretty depopulated landmass with lots of people in a few urban areas and then big parts of the middle of the country that had very few people. Um, the animals were eating some kind of grass, either hay, alfalfa if it was planted, you know, otherwise just wild grasses. And it was the Great Plains, there was plenty of grass. Uh, couldn't be farther from that today. Yes, there's a few small cattle farms that are raising cows on grass, on pasture, um, but the vast majority are in these enormous feedlots. Uh, thousands of animals big in Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, eastern Colorado. Just, um, uh, it's hard to describe unless you've seen them. I mean, they're overwhelming in their size and the dust and the, the concentration of these big animals. But what's really different is, let's think about what a cow is. A cow is a ruminant, which describes their stomach. Their stomach is designed to take cellulose in the form of grasses and break it down into what the cow needs. It's not a stomach that's designed for taking feed grains which are really different than grasses. Feed grains are high energy, a lot of calories, the pH is different. And so on these feedlots, the cattle are really eating a diet that they totally were not designed to eat. And it has an impact, it makes them sick. Um, virtually all the cattle in a feedlot develop abscesses in the liver because of the feed grains that they eat. And they know that, so one of the big reasons they use antibiotics is to keep the animal walking just long enough to get it to the slaughterhouse before they get downed by the liver abscesses. Um, so really the, the notion of raising a cow in a feedlot is part and parcel with why they're given antibiotics to such a huge degree.